everyone. This is Safeguarding Matters, a podcast by Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub, RSH. RSH supports organizations in the aid sector to strengthen their safeguarding policy and practice against sexual exploitation, abuse, and sexual harassment. My name is Oge Chupudoze. I'm the Global Safeguarding Advisor for RSH. This is a special podcast series on the mentorship program that is funded by Swiss Corporation in Tanzania. The mentorship program was to support local organizations and local partners. In this special series, we'll discuss the Tanzania mentorship program. We'll look at what worked and the lessons that we learned along the process. We'll have conversations with mentors and mentees to help us to better understand how to improve safeguarding capacity and practice true mentorship. In this episode, I'll be talking with Injeri Kagushia, Samuel Mafia, and Ibrahim Kikoko about the RSH mentorship program to understand what works and they will also share the lessons they learned. Hello all. How are you? You're welcome to this podcast and I'm very pleased to have you in this podcast. Please, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Starting with Jerry, please. Hi, okay. Thank you for the warm welcome. My name is Njeri Kagusha. I am one of the mentors in this program. Pleased to be here. Thank you, Njeri. Can we hear from you somewhere? Hi, Oge, and thank you for welcoming me to contribute to contribute in this podcast. I was a mentor in this program, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. And Ibrahim, please, let's hear from you. Hello, my name is Ibrahim Kikoko. I am one of the mentees from SIF Tanzania, uh, receiving funds from SDC or Switzerland Embassy, Swiss Embassy. Please, what's the full meaning of SIF? SIF means Small and Medium Enterprises Assistance Fund. So SIF is a global impact organization whose mission is to improve lives and communities through entrepreneurs and small businesses because we believe that SMEs are the engine for the growth of the, any economy in the, uh, in the world. So we support, mentor, and train different SMEs and fund them as well so that they can, they can improve their, their businesses and grow. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're all welcome. All right. So before we start, I want to explain our research mentorship program to our listeners. So for RSH, as part of building capacity and providing support to organizations in the aid sector to improve their safeguarding systems and practice, we run what we call a mentorship program. The mentorship program usually is for about six months, and it's a way of organizations to really, you know, understand their gaps and then work with a dedicated mentor who is a consultant and specialized in safeguarding to guide them through. So to help them with identifying their gaps, they conduct what we call OCA, that's Organizational Capacity Assessment, specifically targeted on safeguarding. So it's not a robust, you know, organizational assessment for all aspects of the organization. Rather, it's tuned towards Safeguarding. So the capacity assessment is to identify the safeguarding strengths and gaps. And then with the gaps, you know, um, the gaps are identified. Of course, there might be so many gaps or less gaps. However, whatever it is, they non prioritize the organizations with the support of the mentor non prioritize you know, to what they want to focus on for that six months period, knowing that six months is not a too long a time but it provides just adequate time to work on these key areas. So it can also last up to eight months, depending on how the organization, you know, wants to run it. 
But for RSH, we, we, we conduct six months um, mentorship. And then, so as this organization identify the gaps and prioritize, they now develop an action plan on, on the areas to focus on in the, you know, in the mentorship journey. And working with the mentor, who is, you know, a consultant, like I'd mentioned, they now like work with to address, you know, some of the gaps by implementing the work plan. And with that, by the end of the six months period, they now like do another OCA, another um, capacity assessment to identify the improvements in, in the areas that they've done. So like the first OCA usually serves as baseline and then the final OCA as end line. And also like also a map for the organization to continue continue their safeguarding journey because the journey, you know, shouldn't end, you know, after the mentorship program, but rather it should be, it should be something to whet their appetite to know, okay, we can do more. There are still more to be done. And then we still need to continue on the areas that we've already started on. For RSH, the, our means is to identify consultants who are familiar with the context, we find that this is that this is very important where the consultants you know or the mentors actually are familiar with the context you know so and um, with this we identify national or regional consultants that guide through this and for RSH we have like our database of safeguarding consultants that organizations can search and be able to identify um, consultants based on specific areas based on the organization need on what you know the organization needs so yeah I will encourage people to go on to our safeguarding directory so for the Tanzanian program it's funded by Swiss Corporation in Tanzania. So this specific mentorship is funded by Swiss Corporation in Tanzania. And, you know, they funded it and wanted RSH to come in and support their partners. And so, yeah, so to support their partners. And then we engaged consultants from Tanzania and from Kenya to guide they improve to provide this mentorship and support. So yeah, so that's an overview of our RSH mentorship program and the work we did in Tanzania. All right, so I will now turn on to our panelists. So let me begin with you, Samuel. What was your experience as a mentor with RSH supporting organizations in Tanzania? Thank you so much, Oge. And I would like to share my experience by echoing what you just mentioned when you are speaking about the process itself. And I wanted to begin by saying the Resource and Support Hub have designed a very creative and innovative procedures on mentorship program. And why do I say this? Uh, what I mean is that a Resource and Support Hub does not design mentorship program to be a lecture or a top-down approach or, you know, a cascading information. They have designed it in, in, into the way that uh, the end users uh, or the local CSOs have the space, the chance to contribute, to digest and think along what are fit for their purpose in terms of the project and operations. So the way this program went and myself as a mentor, I found it very useful and it was very creative from uh, uh, OCA itself. I mean, organization capacity assessment, when the organization were empowered by the mentors to self-assess themselves and then come up with the action plan. And then as the mentors, we were providing regular training, capacity building uh, on how they can work on the identified gaps. But this, again, couldn't be possible if it was not for the comprehensive support from resourcing support hub in terms of the holistic resources. So you find that whatever the organization finds the gap, resourcing support hub have the information or have something in their repository that can help this organization adapt and come up with something, let's say on risk assessment. So there are lots of resources that resourcing support hub were sharing with the mentors you know, to capacitate the organization. So I would say uh, Resource and Support Hub was very creative on the design of that program. And as 
myself as a mentor, I found it very productive. My gratitude to the local CSOs, uh, leadership management and mentees themselves, because without their commitment, this program won't be successful. We witnessed in the cross-learning workshop in the end of the program, the testimonials that uh, the safeguarding culture had started growing within an organization, but that's because they were there to work on what they identified as a gap and they were ready to learn. But again, something that again, resource and support have put in place is to open the door for peer, peer learning. So as a mentor, I was able to reach out to my fellow mentors, and orgate yourself, you know, to share experience in the mid uh, of the program, experience challenges and help each other how we can better uh, on that program. So that would be my experience. And I thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel, for all that, your, your experience in, in the implementing the mentorship program as a mentor, you know, showed from what you shared with us that leadership is very important in safeguarding because, like you mentioned, if the organizations are not committed, if the leaders are not committed to safeguarding, then it wouldn't be. So thank you for sharing that. And also bringing out the peer learning and having to learn, you know, and share with your fellow mentors in this, you know, it will be, I want to also highlight at this point that we had three mentors for this particular Tanzanian mentorship program where each of the mentors supported, mentored two organizations. So a total of six organizations we are mentored and each mentor worked with two organizations. And yeah, so thank you very much, um, Samuel, for sharing that. And Jerry, from your own experience, do you have anything to, else to add to what Samuel had just shared with us? Thanks, okay. I am in agreement with Sam's input. It was a very special experience to be part of this mentorship program. I enjoyed it. I was challenged. I learned through it a lot of different things. I found that things, some things are pretty important in terms of how you're going to support, how the mentor would support the mentees. First thing I would say is the mentor's knowledge. It's essential so that you're providing solid support to the mentee. But um, my, I have a background in, you know, facilitation and development planning meetings. One thing I, I do is I come into rooms knowing that I am not the only knowledge holder. You know, the people I'm having a conversation with have experiences that could enrich this conversation. And we had really pretty much a lot of freedom to design our interventions with our mentees the way it worked for both mentor and mentees. So for example, Sam and myself, we might have covered the same topics, but you know, we did it in our own ways. I think one of the things I'd, I'd like to highlight, it's essential to be able to allow space for the people you're working with, the mentees and the mentors to contribute to solutions to challenges that maybe they've come across so that you're not the only one who is the knowledge holder in the room. Your soft skills as well are very important. Communication, being able to build a trusting relationship is essential in order to facilitate that skills transfer. Sometimes in the work that we do in terms of safeguarding and prevention of sexual abuse, exploitation and harassment, you might have to challenge opinions that have been long held on or certain behaviors that have been allowed in an organization or that are culturally sensitive. So how you have built up that trusting relationship between the mentor and the mentees is really essential. And finally, I'd say they should have a bit of flexibility. I know we'll talk a little bit about challenges later on, but flexibility to address, you know, when you start off, you start with a plan, but sometimes maybe mentees or the organization will have an experience and come to the mentor and say, I know we had not planned to do resource mobilization in safeguarding, but we are now developing a concept note and we're wondering how do we include 
safeguarding in our resource mobilization work. So a bit of flexibility, you, you won't come to it and say, oh no guys, you know, today we were saying we will only talk about the how to do a risk assessment, not to do fundraising. You open that opportunity to build something together. Thank you, Jerry, for highlighting those as well. Yeah, flexibility is important because other things might come up or other ideas, you know, they might want to explore other topics, uh, but being flexible is, is essential. And the trusting relationship, I liked, you know, how you talked about, you know, having trusting relationship because this is a longer term process, six months you know, that you will be working closely with these people, these individuals. So I, I agree with you that having a trusting relationship is highly important because this is not just about facilitating one training and, you know, going off, but you're, you're working, you're joining with these organizations for a, a length of time. You know. So yeah, that's that's great. Now, there was one thing that you mentioned that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in if you can explain more. You mentioned that you come in with the mindset that you are not the only knowledge holder in, in such a group. That's interesting to know. Can you please provide an example, like, you know, how that had worked for you in practice? Say, for example, in developing a safeguarding policy, I believe, yeah, some of the organizations developed poly, you know, safeguarding policy. How do you bring in such a mindset of not being the only knowledge holder? Thanks, okay. I would, I would look at uh, the example that you stated in the following way. So if we're developing a safeguarding policy, I would come in, I, I come in with the safeguarding knowledge but I do not know my mentee organization as well as they do. I cannot force down their throat certain policy statements if it does not match their organization. So in order to pull together a, a policy and processes that work for them, they have to contribute to that process. They have to bring in the knowledge that they have. For example, organizations are different. You could have an organization with seven different departments, programs, admin, all of these different finance. And you could have another organization that is very lean, that is, you know, maybe five key people. So you will not approach their policies in the same way. Because with this one, you can, you can with a big organization, you could say, well, safeguarding roles are in this job descriptions and not these ones. But in a small organization, they might not even have you know, a, a HR process that they're following. So when we come together to build their policies, their practices, their safe culture, I won't bulldoze my way into the conversation and say, no, 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 international best practice states that you must do X, Y, or Z. You have to be able to come to the space together and come to an understanding together. I hope that answers it. Yes, thank you. So yeah, what I'm hearing from you is like there is a collaborative means of developing policy and you didn't just write up um, a policy for them, but that you worked together to develop um, a policy for the organizations. Very true. And I think that's really an empowering way to go because that knowledge stays with the organization. They've, they're, they've been involved in the drafting and the redrafting and seeking opinions from the rest of their teams in seeking their input on certain sections of the policy. That knowledge remains with them. I will when when I exit that uh, mentorship program in six months, I don't go away with that knowledge. It remains with the mentees. Thank you. All right, Ibrahim, I would like to hear from you as a mentee. So what do you like best about the mentorship program and what would you say works? You are in the organization as a mentee and, you know, you, you were supported by a mentor, you know, your organization was supported. So what would you say that you like best about the mentorship program? 
Yeah, thank you, Oge. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank you guys for this opportunity and also uh, that we were chosen for this mentorship program. What I'll say uh, about uh, what is best uh, in, the, in this program was that, first of all, the flexibility of the, uh, of the mentors to adjust to their competing priorities and, and tasks. Because, like, for example, we had in September and plus October, we had uh, the internal audit and so it was back and forth sometimes like you have a session but also you have some some deadlines to report on some of the things that the, the auditors has asked so we are grateful that the mentor was uh, very much okay with setting uh, some other time for that so i'll comment on that also the presence of the qualified mentors uh, who are familiar on the safeguarding concepts and where to get resources from the resource uh, and support hub so it was at least with the limited time allocated for this program, at least having that in place, at least help to uh, to finalize this program in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, flexibility is mentioned again, and the resources from RSH and the mentors, you know, qualified mentors who are professionals in safeguarding, you know, contribute is well, like one of the key things you liked. And I believe, would you want, will you say that your organization will be getting back to RSH Hub to assess, you know, other resources on safeguarding? Would you say that? And would you recommend RSH to other users, your colleagues? Yes, of course, I would recommend uh, Resource and Support Hub. First, because it has a lot of resources, like whenever you wanted any tool, or whenever you want any uh, notes or draft policy that are there for you to be able to to check and uh, if you want to adapt them or to change some of the things. And also the presence of the qualified mentors, as I've mentioned earlier, it's one of the things that uh, we look into while maybe you want to work on some on the mentorship of, on, on any kind. So if you have qualified mentor, it will take to be easier to, to adjust to any environment also having the, uh, the knowledge on safeguarding uh, on the fingertips, uh, it's uh, very resourceful. So I'll uh, definitely recommend you guys to uh, any other organizations or to us if you want to improve our systems again. Thank you. So thank you all for the positive reflections about the mentorship program. Now let's talk about challenges. In Jerry, did you encounter any challenge as a mentor and what were they? Challenges, not too many and not too complex. The greatest challenge we had was timing. I, I remember having this conversation with a, one of my mentees and we were debating, should, should the program have been nine months or six months? I feel like, yes, six months was just right for the program because it keeps the progression going. However, th the program was introduced almost, you know, in the middle of mentee organizations programming here. We've had uh, Ibrahim, who was speaking before me, say they had to adjust their regular scheduled programs to make time also for the mentorship and the learning and the assignments that came up. If what, what I would say was great challenge was timing because that competing priorities, they had uh, mentee organizations had programs to implement However, they were also very, very committed to making time to go through this process to, you know, we, we'd set assignments sometimes, request them to go and seek more input from their teammates, request them to go and research something and come back and give feedback. And they did it. They committed to it. And that was amazing to see despite the tight timeline. Again, even in, in terms of timing, Building trust, which we've spoken about, requires time. When we started off, you know, with the original organizational capacity assessment, there was a bit of worry that scoring low on the OCA would impact organizations' fundraising and resource mobilizations. But it took, so it, it, I think for me in the whole process, that's what took the longest time, doing the OCA and and. and you know, working through it with a partner to say, this is not a bashing of the organization that, oh my God, you don't have a policy. How are you surviving? No, no, no. This is identifying places, areas in which this program mm -hmm. can strengthen 
your safeguarding practice and your safeguarding processes. So that building trust in the beginning takes a bit of time and therefore the, the original organization capacity assessment took a bit more time than most of the other processes that we had. Thank you for that. And you really mentioned key thing now that caught my interest, you know, about how building trust, in which you had mentioned before, takes time. And for organizations to to be to be able to be transparent, you know, to be vulnerable, because like conducting the OCA, the OCA is really like calling on organizations to be very vulnerable. And then maybe to this person that they don't even know, they hadn't worked with before. But yeah, it requires time to build that trust, you know, to encourage organizations that, yes, they can be as truthful as they can without fearing to be cut off for funding or to be marginalized or, you know, like put off in a way, but no, rather it's really about building their capacity. So, but yeah, it does take time. Thank you for highlighting that. And of course, um, the time challenge. So for Samuel, what's your own experience? Do you have anything to add in terms of challenge? Well, thank you so much, Oge. I think I, I can echo and agree totally with what Njeri said because that's something that quite, I quite experienced as well. However, in addition to that, there is another challenge that I thought I should use this platform, you know, to pop it up. And this comes during working on the action plan. So when we were supporting or working with these CSOs as they were adjusting, preparing plans, procedures on how to mainstream safeguarding or PSA, you know, uh, in their local CSO, I remember having one meeting with uh, one CSO and there was the question of safeguarding budget. You see, uh, and, and their question was, you see, what we can see is, yes, we, we are going to have a very strong safeguarding measures in place as a CSO. However, we find that most of them, they need to be allocated a budget. Let's say something like training. You are coming up with a risk management plan or risk assessment, and they have budget implication. And their concern was like, most of the donors or funders, they don't include safeguarding as their priority, you know, in the proposal of fundraising. So they only fund programs. You see what I mean? So they will only say, okay, you are having program ABC. So if you mention something about safeguarding, that won't be their priority. And, and out of curiosity, these CSOs were like, okay, so how are we going to convince the donor or funder or our, our INGO partner that we are going to do something about safeguarding? And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, I don't believe that safeguarding is having files fall in the store, but is how we are taking the safeguarding measures into the field and put them into practice and make them the culture. And I absolutely agree they will need a budget. So why do I call that a, a challenge is because Resource and Support Hub has done a great job empowering these CSOs, you see. But again, going forward, where do they go from there? Some of the action needs budget. And therefore, I would like to use this platform, you know, uh, to extend my call to all donors, funders, INGO. That is the high time right now to include and prioritize safeguarding as part of priorities in the proposal of fundraising or donation that they are doing. And the reason is you cannot only focus on the program and you want to achieve a certain impact and you don't have a do no harm plans in place. What would you benefit if you have impacted millions of people in the certain communities, but again, hundreds and thousands of them experienced harm in the program that you are funding? So I would like to summarize that by calling like in humanitarian sector, international development aid, let us think our program. If our programs were the bodies, I would say let us make safeguarding as a blood vessels. Thank you so much, Oge. Thank you, Samuel, for highlighting that. Yes, budgets for 
these small organizations is usually a major thing. And sometimes their donors, their funders do not want to fund safeguarding or are not even have adequate knowledge about that. So this is like a wake up call for everyone. And, you know, so like we say that safeguarding is everybody's business. That includes even the donors and the funding partners. It's not just um, the individual staff and the organization's business, but everybody involved in the chain. Thank you for highlighting that, Samuel. All right. So, Ibrahim, let me turn to you now. As a mentee, what are the changes you would say your organization recorded as a result of the mentorship program? And how do you plan to sustain these changes? Okay, thank you so much, Olga. After the safeguarding, before the safeguarding program, like we didn't have the one single document of the safeguarding policy. So we, we had different uh, numerous policies like uh, child labor policy. And so after the safeguarding mentorship program, uh, we were able to uh, to have an increased knowledge on the policy development process, especially for making the safeguarding policy and the code of conduct. We were able to, to have a training material on on SEA and safeguarding, as well as structured uh, safeguarding interview questions. But but also, we have been able to revamp the safeguarding culture because, like, spending six months on something at the end of the day people will be able to uh, to take it in their their mind be ready to practice it so what we are planning to do pending the approval of the, the use of the new safeguarding policy we are planning to be reviewing it and updating it after every two to three years uh, for sustainability so that everyone is aware and they're comfortable implementing it that is all i can say but also uh, we have we have appointed the safeguarding focal person who, uh, who is me and as well as the safeguarding director. So uh, I think we're in the great state in safeguarding journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Yeah, so you mentioned having a policy now on safeguarding, which is, you know, like awaiting to be approved. That is great. And integrating safeguarding into your recruitment by including safeguarding questions in your interviews. And, you know, generally promoting it as a culture of your organization where you want to be raising awareness so that everyone understands their role in safeguarding. That's what I heard you say. So great job. Well done. So and then you mentioned that you are now the safeguarding focal person. So before this mentorship program, you didn't have a focal person, but now, you know, you've taken on that responsibility as safeguarding focal person and your organization also has a director that is, you know, oversees safeguarding. So why do you think it's important for organizations to have a safeguarding focal person? What are the roles of a safeguarding focal person? Thank you, Olga. There are many important so advantages of having a safeguarding focal person. As you know, the safeguarding focal person is the, a person who will be like and content owner responsible for updating the policy, also raising awareness among staff and community partners on, on different areas of on, on safeguarding and ensure that if they have any issues, they are well taken care of. But also working with staff to include safeguarding objectives in the performance goal setting and, and appraisal. As for me, I'm the safeguarding focal person, but also I'm the HR and operations manager. So having this title, it's it's an adv advantageous and important to our organization because like we will ensure that we ensure recruitment process ad adheres to the safeguarding standards and no staff or consultants or partners with safeguarding concern are, are employed in the organization. Thank you. And yeah, you have a lot to do. Great to also hear that you are the HR and operations person in your organization. So it also fits in well in terms of safeguarding. All right. Thank you all for these wonderful insights into the mentorship program. We are nearing the end. And now I would like to hear from you what your final words to our listeners are. Sam, do you want to start off to give us your final call for action? Absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you. Mine would be a wish. What I wish that uh, 
more and more local CSOs will have received such a mentorship program. And I feel like what we have, we have done or what resources and support have, has just done is just a pilot to show how mentorship is important to local CSOs, not only in Tanzania, but globally. And I would like to, to extend my call out there like that we need mentorship program. We need to empower CSOs. I'm not a good fan of uh, cascading policies or dictating like you should have one, two, three, one, two, three. But I like uh, resource and support hub approach of empowering them, respecting their context and helping them to develop policies, guidance and procedure that fit for purpose. That would be my call. And I, I really appreciate the great, great work that resource and support have has done so far. Thank you so much, Oge. Thank you, Samuel. And Jerry. Thanks, Oge. On the whole, this experience has really solidified for me that when we commit to a longer term engagement in terms of providing support to improve the safeguarding, the prevention of SEER, the processes, the culture of organizations, it is really impactful, much more impactful than one-off trainings, even if it was a 10-day training. You know, this longer-term engagement of mentorship felt and actually was a true skills transfer program, and I, th I thought that was amazing. So I'm really excited that, as Sam said, RSH have, it, it's a pilot, and we hope it goes so much further than the six organizations we worked with. Thank you, Njeri. Ibrahim? Yeah, thank you, Olga. So I believe that uh, more organizations will benefit from, uh, from this uh, program, but when there's an adequate time to work on the key areas that needs improvement. But also, I believe that if Donna would, would set a budget for implementation of safeguarding policy, for example, training and mentorship to our partners, staffs and community uh, would make more sense because, like, for, for example, we have a, a lot of partners, we have a lot uh, of people we are working with, but who, whom we are giving funds, whom uh, we are supposed to ensure that they have this safeguarding policy. So it's either we are supposed to train them, to provide mentorship to them, but like we do not, we do not have a, a specific budget uh, line item for that. So I think it's, it's a challenge that we are working to know how to, uh, to, to navigate that. Thank you, Ibrahim. And thank you all for your insightful discussion. Thank you for sharing your experiences, what worked in, in the mentorship program and what to improve. It's great hearing from all of you. And I really want to also thank the Swiss Corporation of Tanzania that actually funded this mentorship program in Tanzania. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners for listening on to this point in our podcast. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, The Safeguarding Matters. If you want to learn more about this program, please visit our online hub at safeguardingsupporthub.org. Safeguarding Support Hub as a single word, dot .org and please subscribe to our newsletter. If you have any comments on this episode or want to share your thoughts for the focus of future episodes, please sign on to our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Contact us on info at safeguardingsupporthub.org. And thank you for joining See you in our next podcast. Bye.